Today on the Matt Wall Show, pro-abortion activists are gloating today because of a documentary that allegedly shows a prominent pro-life activist confessing, quote unquote, on her deathbed that she was uh, paid by the pro-life cabal to pretend to be pro-life. Um, we'll take a look at this story. There's a lot, there, 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 a lot of questions are raised. There's a lot of reason to be skeptical, and we'll talk about that. Also, five headlines, including Planned Parenthood, apparently uh, stealing stimulus money that was supposed to go to small businesses, plus our daily cancellation and uh, some of your emails, much more, all of that coming up. But first, a word from our good friends at Noom. You know, in my experience, one-size-fits-all approaches just don't work at all in, in any facet of life. I mean, you look even at one-size-fits-all clothing. Uh, none of that stuff ever fits me. I'm a very oddly shaped sort of person, I've discovered. And so if it's one-size-fits-all, it won't fit. That's especially true when it comes to fitness and health and diet and exercise. With all the diet and exercise noise out there, how do you know which one works for you? You decide what your goals are. That's what it should be. And Noom is going to help you reach them. This is not a one-size-fits-all. This is a, a personalized thing that's going to work specifically for you. Noom is not a diet. It's a healthy and uh, easy to stick to way of life. That's been my experience with it, certainly, is that it's that's the main thing. It's you, you can actually stick to it. You can form those good habits. It makes it a lot easier to form those habits. Um, you know, we're all strapped for time. We don't have all the time we want. And that's why if you can only commit 10 minutes a day, then that's what it'll be. And Noom will make that work. Join the Noom community now. Pair up with a virtual coach to plan your strategy to reach your goals. Your personal coach and the Noom community are there to keep you in check and also to inspire you. Um, along the way. So shut off all the noise and sign up for your trial today at noom.com slash Walsh. Get personalized guidance at noom.com slash Walsh. That's noom.com slash Walsh. Okay, let's talk about this. 60 million, well, and we'll start with this. 60 million human beings have been slaughtered by abortion since it was legalized in this country. Uh, it's, it's no surprise that the supporters of this massacre would lack ethical scruples, to put it mildly, which is why, you know, I was disgusted, but certainly not surprised or shocked at all by this article in the Daily Beast um, gloating about a documentary that supposedly shows Jane Roe of Roe v. Wade confessing on her deathbed that her pro-life conversion was an act that uh, she put on for money. Now, backing up for just a moment, um, this is Norma McCorvey, aka Jane Roe. She was a, she was the woman at the the center of the infamous legal case that led to abortion being legalized across the country because the Supreme Court somehow discovered within the Constitution this uh, mythical right to an abortion. Actually, they found the mythical right to an abortion f by first locating the mythical right to privacy, which is a, which is which is also not in the Constitution. And so, uh, and, and from there, they got to the right to abortion. Just a, a horrible legal decision that even if you're in favor of abortion, if you're an honest person, you would have to look at that legal decision and agree that um, there are a lot of problems with it. Well, uh, it's well known that McCor McCorvey later in life had a change of heart and became an outspoken and prominent pro-life activist for many years, okay? So this wasn't like something that happened in the last six months of her life. This was for many years, um, in the later stage of her life, she was a pro-life activist. And this fact has always been a source of heartburn for pro-abortion activists who were quite upset that they couldn't continue using her to keep abortion legal the way that they had used her to get it illegal, uh, to get it legal in the first place. But it seems that they found a way um, to manipulate and exploit her again, even in death. So according to the Daily Beast, this upcoming FX documentary uh, titled AKA Jane Roe will show McCorvey shortly before her death in a nursing home in 2017 claiming that her pro-life conversion was all an act. She was acting the whole time. And supposedly she admits that pro-life operatives paid her to lie for 20 years and pretend to be pro-life. Um, this, of course, supposed revelation has been met with all of the grotesque bragging and football spiking that you would expect from people who, again, support and applaud the mass butchery of, of, of children. 
uh, including, and, and many people, many, many pro boards have jumped in on this, uh, including Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez sent out a tweet, just thrilled with it and using this as an occasion to attack, uh, quote unquote, right wingers and so on and so forth. But there is good reason to be extremely skeptical. Um, McCorvey was an elderly woman hooked up to an oxygen tank in a nursing home at the time this documentary was filmed. I haven't seen the documentary yet. Nobody has. It hasn't come out yet. But uh, she was an elderly woman hooked up to a nurse. She was in a nursing home, oxygen tank. And then the director director of the uh, documentary, Nick Sweeney, shows up to interview her. Now, we should note that Sweeney is a far-left radical whose previous films include a BBC special uh, celebrating transgender children. In fact, let me show you um, the the preview, uh, a little clip of that documentary, just so you can get you get a feel for this guy Nick Sweeney and what he's all about. Um, so just go ahead and watch this. You feel the burn, Maxie? Um. The medicine is so that she doesn't go through male puberty. You know, mm-hmm. one step closer to being like a full woman. make these kinds of decisions for a 12-year-old kid. She can be sterile and, and rips the heart out of you. Sometimes I think, is it the right thing to be transgender? Should I just be a boy? Should I just not be who I am? When I got up on stage, I just felt... Yahoo! Even if they hate me. I'm not changing who I am and becoming who I am. Isn't that great? You got a boy there being drugged by his mother, um, chemically castrated. You know, Nick Sweeney's filming it. It's inspirational music in the background. This is somebody with an agenda. This is, like I said, a far left radical with an agenda talking to an old, dying, and clearly troubled woman. That's the context. Some more context. Another figure who features prominently, apparently, in the uh, documentary is a guy named Reverend Rob Shank, and he's an evangelical minister who had his own conversion experience several years ago, except in this case, it was the opposite. Um, He went from being a pro-life activist to a staunch defender of abortion, and right now, he um, he continues to be a minister, quote-unquote, but now he's against overturning Roe v. Wade. He says that overturning Roe v. Wade would cause chaos and pain. This is a minister saying this. Um, And he's another guy that's involved in this documentary. It's interviewed in the documentary. So to reiterate, this is not an objective piece of work dispassionately documenting an old woman's honest confession. This is far left propaganda. And so the appropriate portions of salt must be taken alongside it. Um, It's important to realize that McCorvey's pro-life transition happened over the course of several years. Okay, if she was acting, then this was method acting that would put Daniel Day-Lewis to shame. This is, this is, I mean, this would be someone who, who spent years and years developing her act and keeping it going, even in private. Because many people who knew McCorvey personally uh, have come forward to say that she spoke passionately about her pro-life convictions in private all the time. So was, was that all part of her act? Or maybe these people are in on the conspiracy. I don't know. Speaking of conspiracies, who are these nefarious pro-lifers who conspired with McCorvey to pretend to be pro-life for 20 years? I have been in the pro-life movement myself for many years, and I'm not aware of any smoky back rooms where these kinds of plots are hatched. Now, it's possible that I've never been invited to them, or maybe I'm in on it, and I'm just saying it for that reason. Maybe I'm being paid too. Who knows? Um, In fact, The Daily Beast even mentions that McCorvey, as part of her conversion to Catholicism, which coincided with her conversion to being pro-life, I mean, all of this came together, uh, she eventually broke off her romantic relationship with another another woman that she was having. She she struggled with same-sex attraction for her entire life, and the Daily Beast even says that she talked about this struggle in, quote, anguished interviews. So was that all an act, too? I mean, did this woman dedicate decades of her life to some sort of bizarre conservative satire act? Is that what this is? That's what you would have to believe in order to take the deathbed confession story at face value. 
Um, McCorvey would have had to have lied about almost everything to almost everyone for decades. And for what? Some money from a non-existent pro-life conspiratorial cabal? You know, I mean, the thing is, if, if this was someone who's just a mercenary in it for money, then she could have made a lot more as a pro-abortion figurehead. I mean, if, if that's what this is about, she made a, she made a, 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 a pretty serious miscalculation. Planned Parenthood, Guttmacher Institute, uh, you know, now, NARAL, these are pro-abortion organizations that have a lot of money to throw around. And they've got a lot more money to throw around than pro-life organizations do. I can tell you that right now. Um, so if, if she was just in it for the money, then she uh, didn't need to fake being pro-life to make money off the abortion issue. She could have done it on the other side and made a lot more. So the whole idea is just plainly absurd. Well, then what do we make of this claim that she apparently made on film, that she was uh, acting the whole time and was paid off? Well, I don't know. Maybe it's true. You know, maybe Jane Roe, Norma McCorvey, McCorvey was a very dedicated performance artist. It's possible. Or maybe she was a confused old woman being manipulated by pro-abortion activists. That also, I think, is very possible and quite a bit more possible. Or maybe some other explanation. You know, who knows? Of course, in the end, none of this has any effect on the reality of abortion. Whether she was really pro-life or not, and I think she was, um, it, it doesn't have any effect on whether abortion is right or wrong. And of course, it is wrong. Because the reality of abortion is what I said at the top. It is an act of violence against the innocent, and 60 million innocents have died because of it. Whatever Norma McCorvey did or didn't think, abortion is a hideous evil, and the transparent attempt to exploit an old woman who is now dead and unavailable for comment is also hideously evil. But these people will just stop at nothing. One other point about, uh, about this that I was just thinking about. You know, when you talk about deathbed conversions or, or confessions, uh, one or the other, Usually people on the left are very skeptical of these kinds of stories because you hear them a lot on the other side. Um, so just one example I would, I would give you. A philosopher by the name of Anthony Flew, who's, who died a few years ago, and he was an atheist philosopher, a uh, very outspoken atheist for many, many years. Well, towards the end of his life, in the last couple of years of his life, he converted and, uh, and, and, and wrote a book uh, saying that there is a God. Now, he, wasn't, he, didn't, he, he didn't become a Christian. You know, he, he didn't believe in the Abrahamic God. He became basically a deist, but still really significant. Um, and like I said, he published, it wasn't just a documentary. He published an entire book laying out his arguments. Well, at the time, many atheists, and you know, not everyone that's an atheist is on the left, but there's a lot of crossover there, of course. Uh, many atheists refused to believe it. And in fact, there was a, an entire uh, article, a very long, lengthy article written in, I think, the New York, New York Magazine, uh, New York Times Magazine, uh, claiming or, or, or arguing that this conversion was false and that he was an old man, his mental faculties declining, and he was manipulated by, um, by, by Christians, by evangelicals, who you know, took advantage of the fact that he was basically senile and that was the claim. And there are a lot of atheists who said that about Anthony Flew. I don't know if that's true or not. And in fact, I read his book. Um, I believe the book is called Why There Is a God. You know? And I have to admit that I was, it, it even struck me as a little bit weird. Uh, because this was a, you know, a very intelligent philosopher, very rigorous philosophical mind. I'd read some of his atheist work that he'd done. And then I read his book, this dramatic conversion, um, or, or not really conversion, but a change of mind. And uh, it wasn't as philosophically rigorous as I would have thought that it, it would have been. Uh, and so it did strike me as a little bit strange. I'm not saying that I think he was manipulated by dastardly Christians who convinced him. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what happened. But it did, it did strike me that this is a guy, lived his whole life, was very articulate in his defense of an idea that I happen to disagree with. And then at the very end of his life, while his, you know, 
potentially his mental faculties are declining. He has this change of mind and, uh, and then he dies. But on that, you know, you've got atheists saying, I don't know if I buy it. Even though he said it, I don't know if I buy it. It seems like there's something else going on here. Maybe there was, maybe there wasn't. Well, now we look at this and just watch as a lot of those same people are going to take it at face value and say, oh, well, she said it, so that's it. You see, this proves not only was she a, a, a pro-abortion the entire time, but it proves something about the pro-life movement, that the pro-life movement is some sort of, as I said, conspiratorial regime that uh, pays people to pretend to be pro-life. All right. So double standards all over the place. Let's go to headlines. Number one, staying on the theme for a moment, uh, 37 Planned Parenthood affiliates filed for a combined $80 million in loans from the Paycheck Protection Program during the coronavirus. Uh, they did actually receive the money. Now the government says they want the money back. This was all originally reported by Tucker Carlson. The Small Business Administration is saying that they never should have received any money or applied for it because organizations with, with over 500 employees don't, don't qualify because they're not small businesses. Um, Planned Parenthood has thousands of employees. They're very far from a, this is a, this is a billion dollar organization with thousands of employees, doesn't qualify as a small business. Um, and Planned Parenthood would have known this, of course. They knew what the rules were. I knew what the rules were, just from following the news. So this would seem to be a deliberate attempt to scam the system, which is no surprise, coming from Planned Parenthood. And this is what I was trying to say about the McCorvey thing. You have to understand that abortion activists, people in the abortion industry, are extraordinarily dishonest all the time. You cannot trust a word they say about anything. They just lie, lie, lie all the time. And anyone with any experience dealing with these people knows this. And here they are trying to scam the system during a pandemic to bilk millions of dollars out of the government that should have gone to small businesses. They already get half a billion dollars a year from the government. Man, that's not enough. They need another 80 million. Number two, this seems like pretty big news. NASA scientists may have discovered evidence of a parallel universe where time runs backwards. Kind of feels now like we're living in that parallel universe. Maybe the two have mer merged or something. Um, the Daily Wire reports, scientists at the National Aeronautics Space Administration have conducted a series of cosmic ray detection experiments which have found particles that could be from outside the universe. So quoting now the Daily Star, um, NASA's Antarctic Impulsive Transient antenna, antenna uses a giant balloon to haul delicate electronic antennas high into the cold, dry air above Antarctica, where there is little or no radio noise to distort the findings. There is a constant wind of high-energy particles coming from outer space, some of which are millions of times more powerful than anything we generate ourselves. Low-energy particles, neutrinos, can pass completely through the Earth, barely interacting with the substance of our planet at all. But higher-energy particles are uh, stopped by the reassuringly solid matter of Earth. That means that high-energy particles can only be detected coming down from outer space. To detect a heavier particle, a tau neutrino, coming up out of the Earth would imply that these particles are actually traveling backwards in time, and that is exactly what the Anita scientists have said. The findings suggest evidence of a parallel universe. Okay, does that make sense? It does to me. I mean, I understood everything I just read there. Okay. Basically, to recap... Um, uh, uh, the, the high energy um, thingies are doing something, okay? And and there's this big balloon that you know is is, is involved. And um, anyway, then we discovered a parallel universe. So that's just breaking it down in layman's terms. Pretty big news. Number three, and Michigan's governor uh, Governor Karen, uh, also known as Gretchen Whitmer is in talks to be Joe Biden's vice president, apparently. She revealed that on the Today Show, uh, and talking about it publicly was, of course, her way of, of angling for the role. Now, this is really something else. Whitmer is quite possibly the most hated woman in America right now. I, I can't think of who would beat her for that, for that trophy. I mean, maybe Nancy Pelosi, I don't know. But I think, no, right now it's Whitmer. So Biden is considering bringing on board his ticket a woman who is so despised that there have been protests against her in her home state like every day for two months. Brilliant. So it's either, it's either her or Stacey Abrams. Um, Stacey Abrams, a woman with no political talent, 
no achievements of any kind. So those are that's what we've narrowed it down to, those two. If I were a woman, which I could be, you know, you never know, I would feel pretty insulted right now that Biden has committed himself to picking a woman, which is already stupid and patronizing enough, and then these are the two that he's narrowing it down to? You, you, you really couldn't, I mean, you literally couldn't pick worse candidates than these two. Number four, uh, but I think it's a great idea, let me just say. I, and I hope that Biden picks Gretchen Whitmer. Number four, um, and an update on this important story. As we covered yesterday, Nancy Pelosi said that Trump is, a, is morbidly obese. We talked about that yesterday. Well, Trump responded, as we knew he would, by saying that Pelosi has mental problems. And now Pelosi has come back and said that Trump is too sensitive. And I can't even talk, keep talking about this, good Lord. We are governed by sixth graders. This is what, this is what political disputes have come down to. You're fat. No, you're crazy. Stop being sensitive. I'm telling mommy. You know, it can be interesting to go back and read, for example, the Lincoln-Douglas debates um, in 1958 or whenever that was, um, or read about, uh, you know, re- just read in general about the disputes between politicians 100 years ago, 150 years ago. And you see that there was, you know, often, often very intense disputes and exchanges. Obviously, I mean, we, we, we fought a war over some of those disputes and 600,000 people died. So this whole idea that politics are more partisan, more divided, more, uh, more hostile now than they've ever been, that, of course, is crazy. Um, this, this is child's play in more ways than one compared to what it's been in the past. But when you read some of this stuff, uh, there was a, an eloquence and an intelligence and a depth there, even in dispute, where now it's gone to, you're fat, no, you're crazy. Okay, number five, a Kentucky convenience store landed itself in hot water when a a sign posted on the window went viral. The sign says, here's what the sign says, um, or said rather, because it's been taken down. No face masks allowed in the store. Lower your mask or go somewhere else. Stop listening to Bashir. He's a (laughs) dumbass. Bashir is the governor. Now, I love that sign personally. And, uh, you know, because I'm a sixth grader too. So now someone posted this to Facebook explicitly to shame the business for putting this sign up. And eventually the business owner relented somewhat and said that, uh, okay, he's not going to turn you away if you have a mask, but you don't have to wear one. And this goes back to what I've been saying about the mask issue, which is I think it should be totally up to the business. Their property, their rules. That's my take on it. If, if this business owner doesn't want face masks, that should be his right. Don't like it? Go somewhere else, like the sign says. He should have as much a right to require that you not wear face masks as any other business should have to require that you do wear face masks. And the thing is, um, it's, it's not like there isn't a very logical reason to ban face masks. Just if you want to go to Google and Google surgical mask and theft or surgical mask and um, robbery, and you'll see tons of recent examples of people who have taken advantage of the face mask policies to rob stores or shoplift or steal. And of course that's going to happen. I think about this every time I go into a store now and everybody is in a disguise. Okay, you've got everybody in the store is in a disguise. This has to be hell on earth for loss prevention departments. How are they supposed to, what are they supposed to do? How are they supposed to stop people from stealing? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we have, we have it's, it's as if we have turned off all the security cameras in every store in America. That's the effect because everybody's in masks and there's also no uniformity to the masks. So I've seen people walking in with like, uh, you know, uh, motorcycle helmets on or, you know, I mean, we've all seen this. Um, A lot of people just with bandanas around their face, literally like stagecoach robbers, they're walking into stores. And those bandanas, by the way, you, you've got a bandana tied around your face and it's like hanging down like this, right? You know, like the classic bank robber or stagecoach robber. Um, that's going to, that's a very good way to disguise your identity. But what the hell is that going to do to stop a virus from getting in? I mean, you've got, you've got all this area right down here. I mean, the, the thing is just hanging down. Airflow is not restricted at all. So I don't know how that's supposed to stop 
you from getting the virus or from transmitting it. It, it doesn't seem like there's, that's going to have any effect whatsoever. But again, it is a good disguise. And so this is what stores are dealing with. And that's why companies should be allowed to make their own decisions. You know, about, about it, it, there, there are a lot of risks that have to be balanced. You know, there's the risk of the coronavirus, yeah, but then there's also the risk of having a bunch of people in disguises in your store able to steal, you know, on a whim. Okay, let's go to your daily cancellation. Now for a daily cancellation, we're canceling any and all Democrats who use phrases like believe in science. And for the latest example, here's Joe Biden uh, on Twitter. He says, we need a president who believes in science. Very simple. And that's got, you know, over 280,000 likes, people cheering it on. Yes, believe in science. Now, I agree with the sentiment. Um, my issue is not with the sentiment itself. I, I you know, I, I don't want someone running the country who doesn't believe in science. But the problem is that the guy saying this, Joe Biden, is a Democrat. And what that means is that he believes a man can get pregnant and that women have penises um, and that a human being five seconds before birth is not a person and potentially isn't even a human. Okay, That's what he believes. And we know that any Democrat on the national stage and almost any Democrat anywhere, national stage or not, believes all of those things I just listed, or at least will pretend to believe them, will claim that they believe them. And, you know, you're entitled to those beliefs. You're entitled to embarrass yourself by going around saying it. But you're not entitled to pretend that you support science. I mean, these people think that men can get pregnant, and they still have the, have the uh, cojones pun intended, to go around claiming that they believe in science. This is the most anti-science. The, the modern Democratic Party is the most anti-science political party in American history, bar none. Okay, there have been different anti or, or non-scientific notions that have been popular throughout, throughout history, but nothing like this. In fact, you could go back even to ancient times when people knew almost nothing about the world. You know, they thought that the sun orbits the earth, that there was only one solar system in the whole universe. You know, maybe some of them thought the earth was flat, so on and so forth. They thought that there were like demons under the ground shaking the earth during an earthquake. All of that, and, and, and they could be excused for thinking all of that because they didn't have modern science. They didn't have the tools that we have. Even they knew that men can't get pregnant. I mean, they knew that much at least. Now, in modern times, we have all the scientific tools at our disposal. And now we have this, this insanely anti-scientific notion that has uh, taken hold in the mainstream of the Democratic Party. And if you're going to say that, then you can't pretend to support science. And it just it continues to uh, amaze me, although it shouldn't, that we have these prominent politicians who believe, again, that men can get pregnant, and they're never asked about it. They are never even asked to explain that point of view, to justify it, to explain how they arrived at that point of view. Never asked. I mean, not one, I, I haven't seen it at one debate. Just posing it to the Democrats. So you believe men can get pregnant. Tell me about that. That's all. Just set them up and, and I, I, I want to I want to hear one of these people. Just give me, give me like two minutes on that. Just talk about that idea of men getting pregnant for two minutes. Explain that. I don't even need a follow-up. I just need the original. They're not asked because of, course, because of course they can't be just, it can't be justified. And uh, the media knows that. That's why they don't ask it. But uh, that's why they can't claim to believe in science. So all of that is canceled. We're going to go finally to emails. And you can email the show if you become a Daily Wire member have access to the mailbag. Uh, let's go to this email from Daniel says, Dear Matt, I understand you keep bees and your wife is a chicken farmer, which means you both have hobbies. You also have a huge family. How do you guys do it? My wife and I dated for four years before we were married and now we have a perfectly healthy one-year-old that we love with all of our hearts. Since our son was born, there has been a new conflict between us. I was in a band for years when we were dating and had to give that up when our son was born. 
It bothered my wife that I left once a week to rehearse. I travel a lot for work as well, so I agreed that a band was just too much to take on at this time. It was a hard choice for me to make, but it was a logical decision to quit, especially because we have conflicting work schedules. Podcasting is something I've always wanted to do, and I figured I could do it from home. I asked my wife for a few hours once a week to prepare and record episodes. She first agreed, but backpedals when I take her up on her word. I feel like uh, I can't have a hobby at all, and I have always been someone who, that feels the need to create art. Music or comedy doesn't matter. My wife doesn't have any hobbies. The way she sees it, the baby is the only thing that matters. Uh, what should I do? Am I selfish for wanting me time? It's hard not to feel guilty about my wants when it seems my wife doesn't even need her alone time. It's a confusing time for me. Okay, Daniel. Well, no, you're not selfish. Uh, I'm, I'm sure your wife is feeling overwhelmed right now, which is understandable. You guys are pretty new to the um, parenting gig. And congratulations, by the way, on the baby. But trust me, in the long run, she'll be happy if you have interests and hobbies and talents that you've cultivated. Uh, it makes you a more interesting person. It makes you happier. It makes you more well-rounded. And those are all things that wives appreciate in their husbands and husbands and their wives and people and people generally. So this is not a selfish pursuit. I think in the long run, you know, she, she, she if because she's overwhelmed right now, she's trying to stop you from, from having other interests, I think in the long run, she would regret that. Now, the truth is, if I'm just being frank about it, that your wife, based on if you have presented it in, a, in, a, in an accurate way, okay, which I'm not accusing you of lying, but then again, you know, in, in disputes, people can uh, sometimes tend to see it their own way and not the other person's way. But if the way you're presenting it is completely accurate, then your wife is the one being selfish right now. Okay? Um, if it's true that she doesn't want you to do anything or have any fun outside of being with her and the kid, then yes, that is certainly selfish. And you should communicate that. You know, it, maybe not in the way that I am right now, but in your own way. So if I were you, I would say something like, listen, honey, I need to have some time to myself to do these things that I enjoy and are important to me. I'm going to take that time because there's no reason that I shouldn't. Okay. So I'm just, I'm going to do it. Um, I will be more than happy to give you your, your own time as well. I, I think you need to have some time too. And I will be more than happy to make sure that you get that time also. But I am, I am going to take the time. So, you know, I'm just, I'm a big believer in being honest in a marriage. I'm also a big believer in spouses giving each other time to themselves to pursue their own interests and, and be their own people. You know, I think that's really important. And I'm always kind of uh, shocked when I see these marriages where that doesn't happen, which I guess is kind of common, I suppose. So that's my take on it. And by the way, the idea that you can't play music because you have a kid is, is pretty crazy in my view. I mean, why shouldn't you? Like I've, I've mentioned before, one of my other hobbies is fishing. I like to fish. And um, I've talked to many guys who will say about fishing, oh, I love doing that before I got married or before I had kids. But of course, now that I have kids, I can't do it anymore. Um, or, you know, and you hear that about insert any other hobby, fishing, brewing beer, playing basketball, playing music, whatever it is. And you hear that and I think, well, what do you mean you can't do it anymore now that you have kids? Why, why can't you? I mean, just because you have kids, it doesn't mean literally every single second of the day that you're not working, you have to spend um, watching the kids. Like, there, there are two of you in the marriage. It's one of the advantages of having a marriage. And so there's absolutely no reason why you guys can't give each other breaks. And you should do it. One, for your own sanity, and two, um, also to, so that you can pass these interests and passions on to your kids. You know? If you, and that's one thing about, about um, one, one difference I've noticed about men and women, in men and women, is that, you know, women will tend to do things with the kids that the kids enjoy, which is great. You know, a kid, a woman's going to get down on the kid's level and play games with them that they enjoy, which is, which, and, and kids need that, which is why they need a mom. Dads are more likely to incorporate a kid into something that we enjoy. And um, I think kids also need that. And so if you like to fish, then you're going to bring the kid fishing. The kid's going to become and, and is going to get better at that and is going to like that. If you like music, then you incorporate the kid, your child in that. And, and, and your child will become a, a great musician in, in, in short time because you are. And that's, that's a, one of the blessings and gifts that you can give your kid. But you have to maintain your own interests and cultivate your own skills and talents 
so that you can pass that on to your kid. That's one of the advantages of doing that. Um, so that's my take on that. All right, from Shalom says, my future dictator and, and saver, I saw a speech of yours on YouTube. In the video, it looks like you're sweating and the audience are trying to cool themselves down. I just want to know what's the story behind this and what will there, will there be any punishment when your day of glory comes? Yes, um, I've gotten so many questions about this over the last year. There is a YouTube video of me out there um, sweating profusely, more than normal, where I'm, I'm giving a speech and just like pouring sweat, okay? And that was my speech at Baylor last year. Some people may remember, even though Baylor's a Christian university, there was a lot of pushback in me going to the university. A lot of people didn't want me there, especially it seems like uh, the powers that be in the university didn't want me there. Some of the students didn't want me there. I showed up anyway. I gave the speech. It was a great turnout. But um, they never turned on the AC in the room. It was blistering out. It was like 85 degrees in there, a small room in Texas. Okay, I think this was in May. And, uh, and he got all these people packed in there. No AC is turned on. And so it's really hot. And yeah, I'm just like sweating through the entire thing. And everybody else in the room is sweating too. Now, I wouldn't necessarily claim that this was a, a deliberate thing the university did, except for the fact that as soon as my speech ended, the AC kicked back on. I mean, my speech ended... And with the speech at Q&A, it was an hour, no AC, speech ends, I'm walking out, and boom, the AC kicks on. So, yes, I believe that it, it was deliberate. I have enough experience with these universities and, and giving speeches um, to know deliberate stuff when I see it. Because very often, it's like this weird coincidence where if I'm going to a university and there's pushback, and I hear that the university doesn't want me there, very often when I get there, there are all these weird little things that go wrong. This is a, what, a, what a strange quiz is. Like I went to Notre Dame, and um, weirdly enough, the university couldn't find a microphone for me. On the entire campus, couldn't find them. There was no microphone available on the entire campus that night. How strange, you know? And so I had to give the speech to like, you know, again, a, a big crowd in a room, no microphone. I had to shout the entire thing. So, uh, but, you know, you, you, you power through it anyway. And... Uh, these are just petty little things that people do. Finally, this is from Taylor. It says, hi, Matt. Thank you for the show. I just want to say that I agree with you about the left's double standard, but honestly, Tara Reid does not seem credible to me, and some of the things that have come out about her do make me question her claims. I hate Joe Biden as much as the next conservative, but I think he's being unfairly targeted here, and we shouldn't go along with it. Yeah, I, I think that there's plenty of reasons to doubt Tara Reid, starting with, as I said yesterday, and as I've said all along, that the very fact that someone is coming out 30 years later, 25 years later, however long it's been, um, you know, decades later, never said this publicly, finally comes out in the middle of a political campaign or in the middle of a Supreme Court hearing or, you know, as soon as this person, whoever it is, is, is all over the news, now you come out and say, hey, by the way, they raped me 30 years ago. Um, doesn't mean it's not true, but that alone is reason to be skeptical. So I agree with you there. And then you read all this, this other stuff, and some of her former co-workers have come out and said that, uh, you know, and, 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 and said basically she's dis she's, she was terminally dishonest and all these other things. Um, yeah, I think all that stuff is relevant in, in evaluating these claims. It goes to her credibility. So I think there is reason to be skeptical. However, um, you say that Joe Biden is being unfairly targeted. I don't think it is unfair in his case. And I'll tell you why. Because this is his own standard. I, I, I don't think it could be unfair to apply someone's own standard back to them. He is the one who said, believe all women. Or, or okay, maybe that wasn't his exact phrase because we learned this yesterday. We have to be specific. What he said, his exact um, wording was that when a woman makes a claim, we should start with the assumption that the essence of what she's saying is true. That's what he said. Okay? Which, in other words, believe women. Well, that was his standard. And he said that in reference to Kavanaugh. And we know the reason he said it was just because he was trying to tear down Kavanaugh. He was, he was taking part in the, uh, in the Kavanaugh lynch mob. So we know that's why he said it. But that was the standard that he set. And so to apply that back to him, um, I think is, is complete. I think that's the essence of fairness. 
Now, I don't think that that's the way it should work in a court of law. So, you know, if this were to get into the courts, which it never will, uh, I, I think the presumption of innocence obviously still applies. But just in terms of the peanut gallery evaluating this, no, sorry, I'm not going to, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not going to pretend that I, that I think this is 100%, 100% true. I'm not going to lie about it myself and be dishonest the way that Joe Biden is. But am I going to go to the bat, go to bat defending him? No, why would I? He's the one who said, he, he, he is the one who said how he thinks these cases should be viewed. And so as far as I'm concerned, all right, I mean, if I'll step back and let that standard be applied to him because that's what he said. Uh, so no, I, I think it would be unfair. Actually, I mean, arguably it's unfair to Joe Biden. If he's the one who said that, you know, he thinks we should give the benefit of the doubt to the woman what he wants. We can't turn around and give him the benefit of the doubt. That's disrespectful to his wishes. And I'm being facetious, of course, but I think, uh, you know, if, if, if a person ends up falling on, their, falling on their own sword to get a dose of their own medicine, uh, I don't see that as, uh, as unfair. You know, I see it as sort of a cosmic justice. But of course, there's not going to be any cosmic justice in this case because um, he's not going to have his own standard applied back to him because of the double standard on the left. And so he's going to, you know, he, he has survived this fine. And uh, I think it's, it's not going to really have any effect. If Joe Biden loses in the general election, which I think is a very good chance he will, it will, it will be because he's a senile man losing his mind and people are uncomfortable with that, which really putting everything else aside, that's enough reason to not vote for him. But thanks for the email. And uh, we will wrap it up there. Thanks for watching everybody. Have a great day. Godspeed. The Matt Wall Show is produced by Sean Hampton, executive producer Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producers are Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling. Our technical producer is Austin Stevens, edited by Danny D'Amico, and our audio is mixed by Robin Fenderson. The Matt Wall Show is a Daily Wire production, copyright Daily Wire 2020. Hospitals are empty, homeless shelters are empty, coronavirus cases aren't spiking. Great news, right? not according to the mainstream media, which is working hard at inventing fake problems to frighten us. Then, the high school science experiment that locked down the world, Joe Biden's new nickname for President Trump, spoiler alert, it's super lame, and an explosive new allegation that Norma McCorvey, the pro-abortion plaintiff in Roe vs. Wade, faked her pro-life Christian conversion. All that and more, check it out on The Michael Knowles Show.